Rhino is a tool for making three-dimensional models, then generating images and drawings from them. Uh, in this video I'm going to show you how to uh, model using extrusions, sweeps and revolved surfaces. We're going to make a balustrade, the sort of thing you might find on a stair or a balcony. Uh, then we're going to generate um, measured drawings of it and lay them out for printing. I'm going to be using Rhino 7 for the PC, but if you're working on a Mac or you've got a different version of Rhino, everything here should still work just fine. Let's get set up. We're going to start with a new file. It's going to use the large object millimeters template. We're then going to make sure that we are looking at the standard tools at the top of our toolbar here. Um, in the properties panels to the right, you need to make sure you can find your properties, your layers, and your layouts panel. Remember that you can uh, view the menu of all the panels here. My gumball on, and I've got my object snap, my O snap uh, selected. The only snap that I've got ticked at the moment is the end snap. Again, if you're on a Mac, this won't be at the very bottom of your screen but below your tools to the left hand side. This time um, I've got some reference images that I want to use. So I can just have these open next to me, but sometimes it's useful to actually put a reference image into your um, document. And you can do this quite easily by simply finding the image file that you'd like and dragging and dropping it into one of the, the viewports. When you do this, it asks you how you'd like to use that image. The simplest one is using the picture mode. When I click OK, it gives me a curse that lets me click once and click twice to insert my picture and you can see that that's actually on a flat plane that I can select and move around um, in my view and that way I've got my reference image right in my scene. I'm going to drag this image in as well. Again I want that to come in as a picture and remember that you can use all the ordinary tools so in this case I might want to scale my image to make it the same size as the other one and select them both and I'm just going to move them to the side so that they're out of the way of my modeling. So in modeling our balustrade we have kind of three parts that we're going to think of. Um, there is the top rail which is the handrail and you can see here that it's kind of got a contoured profile. Um, we've also got a, a sort of a base along here. We don't have one on this stair. Um, they're not always there but in this case we're going to be modeling a sort of a, a base piece. Then we have the vertical pieces here which are um, shaped and contoured. Now the simplest way to begin to make this um, might be to use the box tool um, to create this base piece. So I've selected the box tool. Um, remember that if you want to begin in a very particular point or you want to be accurate you can type in. So here I'm going to type 0, 0, 0 and you can see that that's um, appearing in my uh, command line here. And when I press enter it's now selected exactly that point. Next I'm going to set the width and I think we're going to make this um, about 120 wide and then we're going to set the length 2000 and each time I'm typing that dimension and pressing enter I could click but if I want to be accurate I can also type 120 tall. So you can see that this box that we've modeled is basically a square that we've stretched out, we've extruded. But we can create similar forms um, with more complex shapes than squares. So if I come over here to my front view, I can draw a profile and then stretch it out into a three-dimensional shape. To draw we're going to use some of these um, line tools and the first one we'll use here is the polyline. Um, I'm also going to turn on my grid snap. So at the bottom of my screen or if you're on a Mac at the top um, you can see you turn on your grid snap and now when I move my cursor around you'll see that it's actually snapping only to the points of the grid. So I can click and click again and each time I click I'm adding a point to my line. If I decide that I don't um, want to continue this line I can press escape and cancel out of it or if I'm happy with where I've got to with it I can press enter and that completes my curve. I can also complete my curve by closing it so if I draw a shape I can complete it by closing it coming back to the exact point it's starting at and clicking there and you'll see that that's closed it. So this is an open shape and this is a closed shape. Another tool that you might find useful is just underneath the polyline which is the circle and that works as you might expect. You can click to define the center of the circle 
and move outwards to set uh, its radius. If you only want to draw part of a circle, below that you have the arc tool, which similarly allows you to select the centre and the radius, but then wants you to click again to define how much of the circle we need. So in this case I only need half. If I've got um, one curve like this and I want to close it, I can use a different tool. So in this case so I could come back to my polyline, start at the exact end of that and create the rest of the shape. And I press enter when I'm happy with what I've drawn. And so long as these start and end exactly at the same points, we can close those up. So at the moment these are two separate curves, but if I select them both, I can hold shift to select them both. Um, this is the join tool here, it looks like two puzzle pieces. When I select that, these now connect into one closed curve, and you'll see that my command line is telling me that this is one closed curve. If I've got a shape that um, I want to make a change to, um, I can use the explode tool next to the join tool. This is the opposite of joining, we're exploding it, and now you can see that if I select it, I can select individual pieces of that curve. So I might want to select and delete this part of the curve, and then use an arc to reshape it. Once I've got the pieces that I want, I can select them all and then join them together. And now you can see I've got a closed curve again. A couple more uh, line drawing tools you might find useful. This interpolate points curve, which will create an irregular curve that passes through each point that you select. Or next to that, you have the sketch. And a sketch basically will take whatever your line you're drawing with your cursor to create a, um, a curve. And you can see that it sort of smooths it out a bit, but that it's basically taking the shape that I had drawn. To turn these into three-dimensional shapes, um, I'm going to extrude them. There's a quick way to do this using the gumball. If I select one of the objects, you'll notice that um, I can use this green arrow here to move things. Uh, but instead of using the arrow, there's a little um, ball circle on that line and if I grab that and drag it will extrude that shape and you see it stretched it out to make a three-dimensional shape based on that profile that I gave it. If I move this three-dimensional shape out of the way you'll see that the curve is still there as well. And the other way to uh, extrude is to select the curve that you want and here under the solid creation tool to grab extrude closed planar curve. There's a few different extrusion options. You can extrude a surface, you can extrude vari in various ways. You might want to experiment with those. But the extrude closed planar curve is the simplest one um, and we can use that to extrude our object. So I could just click or I can type in the distance if I want this to be exactly 2000 millimeters long and then press enter. You can see that I've created that extrusion. If I extrude a closed shape using the gumball, which I can do by clicking and dragging or by selecting one and then clicking directly onto the uh, little ball and it asks me for a distance and in this case I want it to be 2000. In either of these cases here you can see that this shape is hollow, it doesn't have an end on it. Um, if you want to close a shape, so I want to turn this from being a hollow cylinder, like a roll of paper, into a solid object, I can select the extrusion. I can find here the Cap Planar Holes tool, and that will put a cap onto each end of my object. I find the Cap Planar, tools, uh, cap planar Holes tool hard to find, so you can also do it by selecting your object and typing the word cap into your command bar. Once you've done that, you've got a closed object. This is a surface, it's open, it's made of a series of surfaces, but as soon as you've got surfaces that are all sealed up with no gaps, you have a solid object. The extrusion works the same no matter which uh, shape we use. So I can extrude that one, select it and cap it. Or I can use the extrude surfaces tool here. So here I've drawn a profile for the base piece and a profile for the, um, the handrail. Um, I just need to close this off using the polyline tool, press enter, and because at the moment these are all separate pieces, I'm going to need to select them all and join them into one curve. This one's already joined. So let's extrude these. I can simply select it and extrude, and I'm going to make it 2000 millimeters long, and then I'm going to do the same for the balustrade. 
remember if you use the gumball and it's hollow, you can simply select the object and type cap. Uh, now these are too close together, I want the top of the handrail to be um, a metre above the ground, so, so here we go, so I'll just move that to the height that I want it, and the, move the curve with it. Um, the top and the bottom of my balustrade using the extrude tool. Next part of the balustrade I make are going to be these vertical pieces and I'm, I like the way that this one here starts with a rectangular base and finishes with a rectangular profile at the top um, and then has a shape on the way down. So I'm going to start with just these nice simple bits, the rectangular bits. Using the box tool um, I've got my end snap on so I can snap right to this point here, say 60 millimeters wide, it's going the wrong way. Remember if it goes the wrong way I can use maybe minus 60 to get it to go in the other direction. Good, and 60 that way. And then I'm going to make it about 100 millimeters tall. And then I'm going to do the same again. This time I think I will just model it straight on top of this one but make it a little bit smaller, 50 millimeters say, and then I can move that up so that it lines up with the top piece there. Now I want to model these um, shapes here and we're going to use a similar process to extrusion. Um, we're going to use a profile um, but instead of stretching the profile out we're going to spin it around a circle. So the way it works is like this, if I use my line tools to draw a shape Center. I can then use this tool here, Revolve, and select the curve that I've made, Presenter. And then it asks me for the start of the Revolve axis, and this is the sort of center that I'm going to spin these around. So I want this to start right here, and hold Shift to make this sure this line is vertical. And you'll see that I now get a kind of circle, and what I'm doing is designating the start point for this circle to revolve around. So there we go, start there. Click. And now as I move this around you can see how it's creating a 3D shape from that um, object. If I snap right back to the, zero, to the zero point, I've now got a uh, circle and I press enter and I'm happy with that. So we can create a um, revolved shape using any, any curve. So let's try and draw one that we can use for our balustrade. So here's the profile I've made. Um, at the moment it's all separate sections but if I select them all and join them now I have a single curve. Let's just go back to where I can see everything all at once and I'm going to use my revolve tool so revolve and the start of the axis is going to be the center of this here and the center of that there now I can click to do this but you'll see it also asks me in the command bar and I can type in so my start angle is going to be 0, I'm going to start at 0 degrees and I'm going to finish at 360 degrees and that can type in, that can create the object that I want there. Now I haven't quite got it centered so if I select this extrusion I can move it over so it's centered on the base. There we go. And you might want to experiment with uh, some different profiles for that or you might want to do um, what we've got here which is several different profiles. Once I've got these three separate shapes I'm going to want to handle these together. Um, so if I select this one, hold shift, select the other two pieces, uh, I can group them. Grouping's not quite the same as joining. When you're joining them you're turning them into one object. Grouping just temporarily handles them together when you select them. So I'm going to click group objects and now you'll see when I select it I get the whole set. I'm going to um, copy this along. The easiest way to copy would be just to drag it out, um, but instead of just dragging like this, hold down Alt and click on the arrow, and that will let you type in a distance. I'm going to type, say, 100. There we go. So I'm going to hold Alt, click the green arrow, type in 100, and here's our balustrade. Now the Revolve tool can be useful for some other things as well. Um, if we imagine that this balustrade needed to go around a corner and we didn't want to have an ugly sharp edge, we might want to create a radius for that corner and we could do that using the um, revolve tool and these profiles that we've already used to define the shape of this balustrade. So if I select here, uh, you'll see that Rhino isn't sure whether I want the curve or the polysurface, so it's giving me the menu to choose. 
I want this curve. So I can see the curve from above here. I'm then going to use my uh, revolve tool. And I want to revolve it around an axis over here. Like that. And then I can, in the top view, define that I want it to start here and go around to here. And you can see that that's given me a nice curve that's continuous with the, um, the rest of the straight balustrade but that goes around a radius. It's open at the moment, it's not a closed shape, so I'm just going to select it and type cap to close it off. Um, this is going to work best if we do the same on the bottom here, so I can select that curve, revolve tool to select the radius, the center line, then to do the same and select the angle that I want, and then I can cap that. And here I've just copied and rotated those um, vertical balustrades to start to follow that curve. So we've used a curve to define an extrusion, which is taking the shape and projecting it along a straight line. We've used um, ro revolve, which takes the curve and projects it around a radius. Um, we can also get the uh, curve to follow any arbitrary line that we want to draw, and we call that a sweep. So we could use any of these curve tools here to draw it. Let's start with uh, the control point curve, and I'm just going to begin, say, here, and define a few points for a curve, and press Enter when I'm done. So that curve is currently flat on the ground, but if I want to grab an individual point, can actually use my gumball to move that so we can make this curve twist out of the plane, go down in three dimensions. We might just move some of these other ones too to get it smooth. So there we go. So that curve is now twisting down around and down. So there's my curve. Next up I need the shape. Now the shape we had was back here somewhere. There it is there. Um, so I could move that over here. The other thing I can do is um, duplicate a face border which means that it will take uh, this face here, and let's do the other one too, and this face here, and when I press enter it will give us the outline of those faces. And the tool we're going to use is called Sweep One Rail. So we want to select the rail, here's the rail we're going to use, and the next is selecting the sweep shape, which is this curve here, and then I press enter. It asks me for the seam point, because, which is only relevant in some cases, so this is fine here, I can just press enter with that. And you can see that it is running that shape along that curve from its initial starting point, but following the angle of that curve um, around and down. I've got some options here too, it asks me whether I want to um, use freeform, which lets the curve twist, you'll see, it lets the shape twist, but in this case I want it to stay perpendicular to the edge of this rail, so I'm going to use road like, which keeps it straight. And I'm going to click OK. And now I have a curve that follows that edge, and again I can cap that by selecting and typing cap. Um, I can do exactly the same using the curve that I've already got for the top rail, so uh, sweep, one, uh, sweep one rail, choose the rail, choose the curve, press enter, um, I'm happy with the set seam point, so I can press enter again, uh, and I'm going to make sure that I've got this set the same as the other ones, that, that the result will run in parallel, and you can see now that I have this other shape following the one below. So I can begin to create more complex geometries using that uh, sweep form. I'm just going to save my file. Now just for simplicity I'm actually going to um, remove those swept shapes. Now let's say we want to provide some measured drawings so that a, a contractor could begin to fabricate um, our balustrade for us. The basic workflow is that we're going to generate um, the geometry, the 2D geometry from our three-dimensional model. We're going to then go into a layout and adjust and tweak that until the drawing reads clearly and then we're going to save that as a PDF. Before I do that, I'm just going to go to my Layers palette here and get myself uh, organised. I'm going to create a new layer called Drawings. Um, I'm also going to uh, delete these other layers that I don't need. Uh, 
uh, and I'm going to create a layer called References. These two images and this curve here are going to go to the References layer. So at the moment they're on the default layer, you can see I'm ticked here. But on the properties for these objects, um, I can see that currently they are on the default layer. I can click the drop down here and choose the References layer. And now that's the layer that they're on. Back on my Layers palette, if I use the little light bulb here to hide that layer, you can see those are now out of the way. I can bring them back any time I want, but they're out of the way for now. I'm going to select my balustrade, and we want to generate these uh, two-dimensional drawings. And we can do that using the Make 2D command. Make 2D is here. Now you can use this here to generate a set of drawings, multiple views. Uh, in this case, I just want to start by generating one view, which will be the uh, right side view. So I just want the view, the right side view. Um, there's a few options here. Tangent edges will draw lines around the edges of curves, which I don't think I want for now. Hidden lines will reveal lines for what's behind things. Sometimes this can be useful, but often it makes the drawing quite cluttered, so I'm gonna leave those off. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I've got group output selected, um, which will just mean that it's easier for me to handle all of those lines once they get generated. And I want to put it onto a specific layer, so I'm giving it the name drawings here because I wanted to put it onto those uh, that layer that I've already set up. So Rhino thinks for a few moments, and it's generated my um, lines. And you can see that this is all in under this drawings layer. Now it's actually created some sub layers under that, which we'll look at in a minute. But I can hide that drawing layer and hide the whole thing all at once, or I can turn it back on. Uh, so if I just hide that temporarily, I actually want to generate a plan as well. So I'm going to select my objects. This time I'll type make 2D. I want just the view, uh, and the view I want is the top one. Same settings as before. Again, I want it to, to appear on drawings. Uh, drawings is currently off, which is why I can't see that. And there it is there. So if I jump to my drawings layer now, I can double click here, or if you're on the Mac, there's a little radio, round radio button you can click. Now this is my current layer, and I can hide the default layer. So now I can see I've got my plan view and my front view. Um, this isn't going to be much good having them lined up like that. So I'm going to select these, I'm going to rotate this one 90 degrees. That way, there we go. And now I'm going to take a moment to line these up. So there we go. Now I'm just going to switch to just my top view. I don't need the other views at the moment. What I want to do is to put these onto a piece of paper. And I can do that in my layouts panel. So if I go to my layouts panel and click new layout, it asks me what size page I want to use. And in this case, I'm going to use um, an A4 page in landscape. And when I select OK, you can see it's set up for me a page with uh, my drawing on it, and it's got this little sort of frame, and this frame here is my uh, view. If I double click inside that frame, now I'm looking through a window into my model, and I can zoom and pan and move around to reposition that. If I double click back outside, I'm looking at my page. Uh, if I select the um, frame here just with a single click and go to properties you can see that at the moment it's at a scale of 1 to 18.197 which isn't a very useful scale so I'm going to adjust this I think I'm going to set it to a scale of 1 to 20 and once I've done that I can also lock the view and that means that uh, even though I can click into the view I can't move it around you can see I'm moving my whole page but I can't move that view I can't scroll the view in and out so that I won't accidentally change the positioning or scale of it on the page now we want to make a few uh, changes to this. Um, there's some things that I don't, some lines I don't need. So for example, here you can see that there's a line where these two pieces were modeled separately, but actually I don't want those to appear separate. I want to remove that line. You can see I've got some extra geometry here. So I'm going to double click into my model um, and now I can select those lines. Oh, when I try and select it, because these things are grouped, uh, it's coming in as a big set. So I'm going to ungroup them so that I can select individual lines and I'm just going to delete the ones I don't want. You can see this is going to happen a few times where I've got lots of things grouped so maybe what I might do is select everything and ungroup it. And Now I can select the individual lines that I don't want and just hit the delete key to get rid of them. 
There we go. So I've given it a, a little eyeball and worked out which lines I don't need. Now at the moment all of these are the same, the lines are the same line width and one thing that you'll want to do in your drawings is to vary your line width, your line weights to make your drawing clearer. And you can do this by using the thickness of the line or by using the colour of the line. The best way I think to manage this is under your drawings layer here, so select the drawings layer, I'm going to create a new sub layer, I'm going to call this fine, and this is going to be for all our thin lines. Then under the drawings layer again I'm going to create a new sub layer called medium for my medium weight lines. I don't think I'm going to have any really heavy lines here, but I am going to hatch some things, so I'm going to select the drawings once more time one more time, add a layer called hatch. Uh, and then the last one I'm going to add is annotations. So I've given myself a series of layers here. All of these. Then in the properties panel here, I'm going to move these off the curves layer onto the uh, fine layer. So that means that they're all going to sit on the fine layer. So now there's nothing left on this curves layer and there's nothing left on this visible layer so I can delete those layers to keep my file organised. So we've organised our drawing into layers for line types. So next we need to actually assign line types to these layers. Uh, there's a few little setup steps here that you'll um, need to check. First of all, um, in the model, so if we click through into our model here, I'm going to select the lines, and on the properties panel here, you can see that their print width is currently set to be default, which is just your default line thickness, um, but instead we want that to be uh, by layer. And that means that when Rhino wants to know how wide to draw these lines, it will look at what setting you've got for the layer. We're going to do the same for the print color to have it by layer. Now when we go back to our layers, we can make some changes to the line types. If you scroll along a little bit here, you'll see that we have a line type setting, and at the moment it's continuous. If we uh, jump out of our viewport back to our page here. Um, we can set the line type not to be continuous but for example we might want it to be dotted. And you can see that now all the lines that are on that layer are dotted lines. We don't want them to be dotted lines, we want them continuous. Um, we can also change the colour because we've told this, uh, all these objects to take their colour from the layer settings. So if I select this here we can change the colour of those lines and now they'll print red. I don't really want that either. And we have the print width. And if we select here, we can choose um, a different line width. So if we want it to be like a very fat line, we could select a thick line. And now you can see that this is drawing uh, very fat. If you can't see your print settings appearing in your viewport, make sure that you're not in your um, model because you can see when I jump back to my model it shows the default thickness again but back to my page my layout and also make sure that your layout is set on print preview so that you can see if we turn off print preview we don't see the thickness of those lines so we can control those now that's much too thick 1.2 so this is our fine layer so we're going to select these uh, set these layers here these lines here to be uh, 0.13 so that's thin lines But for clarity here we want to actually set some of these lines apart. So we've got a number of lines here and I'm just going to highlight these outer ones. So if I jump into my model and select the outer lines, so I've selected those lines just holding shift. Uh, in the properties layer here I'm going to move those lines um, from the fine layer onto the medium layer. On my medium layer, instead of the default thickness, those lines I'm going to set a little bit thicker. We're going to try maybe a 0.3 millimeter line. Remember you jump back out of your model view onto your page to be able to see those lines. And there we go, we can see we've got a thicker line around the edge and thinner lines for the inner pieces. Might even set that from 0.13 to hairline, which is the finest it can draw. There we go, that looks good. Um, I'm going to do the same here. So you can see here I have um, used a thicker line weight for these these uh, the, hand, the top rail and the bottom rail. Now which lines need thicker and thinner line weights? You want to try and create a, um, a range of line weights in your drawing because they'll help it to read more clearly. I actually think that 0.3 is too fat so we're just going to try reducing that a bit. I've double clicked on my hatch layer and I'm going to hatch these end profiles here so it's like I've cut through the, the balustrade here where it's curved around. 
So I can find my hatch tool up here. Here's my standard tools and here's my drafting tools. This is the hatch tool. Um, I'm going to, uh, before I do my hatch tool, I'm going to double click to make sure I'm in my model view. Then I'm going to select my hatch tool and it asks me to select the boundary curves. So I'm going to select the edge curves here that define this shape. And press enter. Then click inside the regions you want to hatch and press enter. Um, and you've got a range of options here for different hatches you might want to use. I'm just going to use the solid hatch. Click OK. Um, I'm going to do the same down here. So I use the hatch tool, select the edges that I want to define the boundary for the hatch, press enter, click inside, press enter, and tell it what kind of hatch to use. If I jump back to my drawing, you can see there we are. That's how it looks with the line weights. <coughs> I think this is actually the wrong colour. I don't think I want these black. Uh, so I'm going to select my uh, hatch here and change the colour of it. I think we might set it to something like that. That's just highlighting that that's not the actual end of the balustrade. That's just where it's been cut off for the drawing. Next up I want to add a little label to my drawing to say um, what this drawing is. So here's the text tool, I can click here and it asks me for what I want to say. Um, I'm going to define the scale here, I want to make sure that I've named the document. You often want to have a, a number, reference number if you want to refer to the drawing from another drawing and I want to make sure that I've got the scale here. Now this is going to be a 1 to 20 drawing. Click OK and I can define where I want that to be. Um, you can see at the moment it's on the hatch layer. I didn't want it to be on the hatch layer, so I'm just going to select my text there. And on the properties menu here, uh, I've actually got a number of sets of properties here, so I want to go back to these ones. I don't want it to be on the hatch layer, but on the annotations layer. And now it will take its colour from the annotations layer. Here we go. I think we'll use that colour anyway. <laughs> and the last thing I want to add here is just a few critical dimensions. So the easiest tool for dimensioning is a linear dimension. Here it is here. I'm going to start from this edge here, go down to this edge here and pull it out. You don't want to crowd your drawing so just move it a little bit out. There we go. You can see here that it's measuring it very very accurately, 1001.6 millimeters, which isn't quite right so I could tweak that a little bit. Or I can actually type in exactly what I want it to say here, like that. Now how am I going to dimension this radius? Well we've got a, a radius dimensioning tool here, radial dimension, and this is the curve. I'm going to start by dimensioning this outer radius here, like that. Again just pull it away a bit, and I'm going to dimension the inner radius here like that. Make sure that they don't confuse each other. And you can see that when I've dimensioned the radius, it's also put in a little center mark to show where the center of that radius is. Um, and then I'm going to use my linear dimension one more time to dimension the length from here. Actually, I'm going to go to that center mark and just pull it off like that. Once I'm happy with my layout, uh, I want to turn this into a printed document, is to go File, Print. Um, and the printer I'm going to choose is going to be uh, my Rhino PDF output. Just check that you're using vector output, not raster output. Paper size correct. And now I'm going to print. And it will allow me to save my file. And here's the file that I have saved. You'll notice that we don't see the edge of that um, viewport. Uh, at this point, you'll want to check your line weights to make sure they all look really good on the page. You're going to want to use a scale ruler to um, check your dimensions to make sure that your drawing has printed at exactly the right scale. And you want to go over your drawing closely to make sure that there's no other little errors or things that you need to come back and correct. So a test print is really important. Um, you may also not be printing straight away. You might be taking your PDF file into another layout program like InDesign or Illustrator um, to use as part of a larger layout. 
from here, uh, go for a walk and see if you can find as many things as you can that could be modelled as extrusions, rotations or sweeps. Once you've found something interesting, come back into your computer and have a go at modelling them. Good luck.